Right. The toilets, there are toilets here. The ladies are to the left and the gentlemen's are to the right. And after Fletcher has given a talk, we'll do a question and answer session. Could I please ask that nobody starts charging in with questions during the speech? We will keep them to the end. So would everybody please give Fletcher Tabatobic welcome. <laughs> Uh, good evening everyone and uh, thank you uh, Amanda for the invitation this evening. Uh, I, by way of introduction, I'm a New Zealand First uh, Member of Parliament um, based in Rotorua. So uh, that's where I grew up and that's where I live and that's where I call home. Uh, but in my efforts to counter and combat the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, I have spoken a lot around the country. And so there's evenings like this that to me are really important and just giving some facts and another side uh, to the conversation on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. I thought I'd use this conversation this evening as a way to put the agreement into context and to um, give a broader view of uh, New Zealand First position on trade and why and how the TPP is actually quite a bad agreement for this country to sign up to. And so with your forbearance, I will go through some broader economic issues and then drill down into the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement itself. I might take my cue from you, Amanda, if I, um, um, if you see anyone falling asleep, or if I go too long, uh, please, uh, let me know because I haven't practiced uh, this um, speech tonight and so I'm not sure <laughs> just how long it will go. Um, I want to start off by making a really important statement that wasn't picked up or was very touched on very slightly by the New Zealand media from the New Zealand First Conference this weekend. And it was a statement from uh, the Right Honourable Winston uh, Peters in his speech uh, to the party and the members in which he essentially said neoliberalism is dead. And it's a really important statement to put this evening into context because we believe that neoliberalism is a failed theory. It is a failed economic um, thinking and we need to move uh, well beyond it. What we've seen over the last 30 years in New Zealand, in the UK, <coughs> in America, <coughs> is a, a, an environment where bankers, um, investment um, experts, and um, like high level businessmen in general have been kind of lauded as the solution people to all the world's woes, even if we're talking about education or health or social services. And it's only now, about eight years after the global financial crisis, that we're beginning to realise, and I say this in a very broad sense when I use the word we, because many of us have um, seen beyond it or through it at an earlier stage, that the mainstream media, not necessarily all of them, and middle class New Zealand are beginning to see the symptoms of this failed economic theory. And it's really important that we see that now. And I suppose one of the most important aspects of that is the aspect of inequality. And inequality, particularly in the United States, but also the UK, and here in New Zealand, have grown almost exponentially over the last 30 years. And that is symptomatic of the failure of this theory. And, and I suppose it's best to try and define what neoliberalism is. It's very, very esoteric. But it's essentially the theory that if you make those 1% really wealthy, the rest of us will somehow go along for the ride. And the, uh, the thinking of uh, the trickle-down effect is an oft 
uh, lauded um, economic theory that somehow if those one percent get really really wealthy and they're doing well somehow all their leftovers will trickle down <laughs> and the rest of us will be better off for it after 30 years of uh, working um, quite tenaciously to that theory um, across most of the western economies i don't think it's fair to say just about everyone even the right um, sided right-minded thinkers um, even, for example the economist a, a main a right mainstream um, publication that believes in the purest of capitalist uh, pursuit are now having the arguments around actually the one percent getting really wealthy doesn't seem to be making the rest of us better off and so we're here today with these decades behind us and what we're seeing now is unfortunately a very rapid increase in the symptoms of the theory and i, I mean <coughs> i speak specifically to the auckland housing crisis the global financial crisis was symptomatic of the thinking <coughs> excuse me of unfettered uh, market activity and somehow self-clearing markets will fix everything and the outcomes from those are the best things since sliced bread. It should be noted though, and, and I'm quoting here, that by historical standards, the neoliberal era, which is the last uh, couple of decades since perhaps the 1980s, has been uh, half as good, it's been twice as bad, uh, for the Western economies as the Keynesian economies coming out of World War II, where government and business were in it together and the mandate was about making sure the people were being looked after, looked after and everyone would benefit together. And from that period, 1945 onward to about 1965, 1970, um, actually 75, what you saw in incomes in New Zealand and around the world was those income groups um, increasing together. So the poorest, their incomes were increasing at a healthy rate, whilst also the richest, were, their incomes were increasing at a healthy rate also. Everyone was actually sharing equally in the success of their um, economic growth. What we know now, and it is undisputable, unless you're a national MP um, <laughs> in the West New Zealand government, um, is that uh, for the last 30 years, uh, the statistics are, are proven in the US, but I, I posit to you that they apply just as equally to New Zealand. The poorest New Zealanders have actually gone backwards ever so slightly. Not remain the same, which um, wouldn't even be a very good outcome, but have gone backwards in terms of real wealth and real income. And that's unacceptable. In New Zealand first mind and in the minds of and I hate to use the phrase everyday kids because we are a society that you know doesn't believe in this hierarchy hierarchy um, where we can't talk to our Prime Minister and give him a nudge in the shoulder and say hey it's not working we do believe that everyone is created equal and we should do our best to help everyone um, as they go through their lives and bad times affect them, whilst lucky ones like myself, um, you know, I haven't been sick yet. I, I have lost jobs but have found other ones quite quickly, but it's not the same for everyone and we start at different places. So I could get into a wonderful debate with the act leader on um, just how we all start out equally in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very frustrating. So. I've, I've touched on the fact that one of the um, most obvious and most unfortunate aspects of this neoliberal ideology is inequality and the, um, how it's coming into effect. The symptoms of it now are, are very tangible. What I put to you, and I'll get to the detail uh, shortly, the TPPA and the TTIP, which is the US European equivalent, are an attempt to solidify 
the kind of um, hold on capital that the very wealthy have, whilst at the same time trying to undermine the resource that is human labour, you and me, basically, and trying to keep the cost of that low in this eternal drive to create growth and um, create ever greater margins and profits for large companies. So, a little bit more detail. I suppose hyper-globalisation <coughs> has, and I said it before, stacked the system in favour of capital uh, against labour. It has been a competition. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and, and this is the point, I really want to make this clear. So, at the moment, most New Zealand businesses are still kind of small, maybe medium enterprises. And New Zealand First adamantly wants to do everything we can to support small, medium New Zealand business. You know, owned by Kiwis, working hard, trying to do their best. Um, but what we see with the likes of the TPPA is an empowerment of those kind of super corporates who are not necessarily Kiwi firms. The only firm I can think of who, will, who could possibly benefit from the TPP is Fonterra. And actually, if you look at the trade elements of the trade, and it's not a trade agreement, of the uh, investment partnership itself, Dairy is explicitly, uh, it's in my future uh, notes further on, Dairy will benefit by zero to 0.1% in terms of actual trade gains, in terms of the reduction of tariffs. That is the true benefit from the TPPA, which is to say no benefit at all. The way our currency is sitting at the moment is more, much more of a detriment or a deterrent to trade than um, access to foreign markets at the moment in terms of real gains. So, more and more people are concerned and worried about what New Zealand has become. And I put it to you in a cheeky sense um, that uh, Francis uh, Fukuyama in an um, essay called Foreign Affairs, oh no, in a magazine called Foreign Affairs said, populism is the label that political elites attach to policies supported by ordinary citizens that they don't like. Populism is a movement against status quo that represents the beginnings of something new. Now, if there is anything that New Zealand First can be accused of, it is populism. We believe that a political organisation is there to listen to the people. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but 67% of the people of New Zealand who were polled opposed the TPP. It was pretty clearly straightforward. And that was after six years of secrecy about what was exactly in the TPP. And 67% of people opposed it. Um, we have been a party for 23 years. I've been a member of the party for 23 years. And it was after my fourth attempt as a candidate in the Rotor electorate that I finally managed to uh, get myself placed high up enough on the list, on number four on our party list, to actually become a Member of Parliament. I'm grateful it took so long, I've learned a lot out in the real world and I hope I bring uh, that knowledge into the party. Um, but for 23 years we have been a party and one of our uh, manifesto, our 15 founding principles is a small government. But we also say the government has a place and a role to play in a modern democracy, in an economy. It cannot be just free markets all the time. Otherwise, we'd have too many cows polluting our rivers. <laughs> well, um, <coughs> yeah, you know what I mean. We, if it was just up to the markets, there wouldn't be much left um, for the customers to buy or businesses to process. But I won't go into that in too much detail. So, 
Neoliberal economic growth has never been particularly strong, and in fact it is now dismal. And those are not my words, this is a summary of uh, quite a bit of analysis from around the world. <coughs> what we've seen after the GFC is a recovery that's actually been very weak, and we know it to be very fragile. Um, there is a widespread belief that another financial crisis is almost just around the corner. And the reason why people think that is because the solutions to this financial crisis in terms of, and just for example, the process of quantitative easing, are frightening. And not only are they frightening, but the way this literal printing of money and giving to financial companies is an abomination. Mm -hmm. And it is making that 1% obscenely rich. And it is not trickling down at all. And in fact, we're just spiralling into more and more debt. And when I say we, I mean governments, I mean individuals, I mean homeowners. The more I speak, the more I scare myself. <laughs> so, yes, and the climate. Absolutely. The climate has been compromised in this race to this kind of, I don't know, utopia profit-making uh, regime. Um, so, National seems to have little understanding that this neoliberal ideology is in its deep throes. And so they are now one of the governments around the world, uh, the 12 PPPA signatories, that are rushing to sign up. We want to be the first, according to National. And this is where I thought it appropriate to come in. I've given you a little bit of context about what it is happening in the world economy. and. Now I will give you some detail on the TPP itself. And uh, I make no apologies. There's a lot in here to talk about that's wrong. That is simply bad for New Zealand. So you'll forgive me if I do go um, on and for, into a little bit of detail. For the last seven years, to put it in context, National has been negotiating the TPP <coughs> and they have been doing it in secret. They had a few rounds, I don't know, in the last year or two before they signed it, where they literally went and spoke to. They, as far as teachers goes, it was transmission teaching. <coughs> the information was going one way, and it was very one-sided, and it was very selective. There was no conversation, there was no consultation. <coughs> Iwi didn't know what they were getting into, and Actually, I'll put it to the government, neither does business. <coughs> and I'll use, I'll use those examples in a second. So that's seven years of secrecy. And then all of a sudden they claim that there's been a large deal of consultation. <coughs> this is the same in the US. So it's a US-created um, um, trade agreement. And it was very secretive. Now, this for me puts the TPP in context and makes people understand just who will benefit from the contents of these 6,000 pages. It was written, it was um, authored by 635 contributors. 605 of those contributors were corporate America or multinationals. They were contributory authors and if a senator, a US senator, wanted to see where it was up to, what was in the draft, what's the TPP looking like now, they couldn't for four and a half years of it being drafted. And then when these authors finally thought it's probably at the stage where um, we should let somebody look at it, they said, yes, senators, you can have a look at it, but you can only look at a physical copy. You can only look at in a physical space that we allow you to go into, and you can't take any uh, recording devices such as a phone, a camera, or I think, I don't think they could even take pens into the room. Yeah. I might be exaggerating on that one. Pencils and paper were okay. Pencils and paper. So that, does that put it into perspective for you on who wrote it, who was in control of it, and I put it to you, who will benefit from it in the end? <coughs> 
Um, so, what was happening at this end was that all grocer would do would come out and say, this is a gold standard trade agreement. <laughs> and trust me, I think he literally said trust me <laughs> at one stage. So we were supposed to simply trust the Minister for Trade that this would be a gold standard deal. When we actually saw some of the actual trade elements, many Kiwis and many businesses and actually Dairy NZ choked on their wheat bills. Um, they've almost retracted it now, but at the time Dairy NZ pretty much said that we shouldn't sign it. Fonterra said if we can't make it any better, we probably shouldn't sign it. But they've all gone back on saying that now. And um, both Gary and Zed and Fonterra are huge supporters of the TPPA. Um, <laughs> even though real, real tariff reductions with regard to the dairy industry will amount to less than 0.1% of gain to the market. Now there's debate who will, who will um, accrue that gain because the argument that our dairy farmers will get the benefit of this trade agreement is bordering on farcical on, in my mind. And what I failed to tell you at the start of this uh, presentation is I'm a formally trained mainstream economist. And I've taught economics for over a decade. And I've taught mainstream, you know, what the government wants you to think. <laughs> I had to teach that in lecture halls and, um, and classrooms. But even in mainstream economic thinking, our farmers won't benefit by 0.1%, as fast as that number is. The claim of $2.5 billion of gains by 2025 is a very misleading number. And it's also a stupidly small number. It sounds like a big number. But by 2025, that's um, less than 1% of our country's economic activity anyway. And so it's quite farcical. But only one third of that is from tariff reductions. And that's the carrot that the New Zealand public are sold when they're told that the TPP is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, well, tariffs will come down and our exporters will be able to go into that market and it'll be a wonderful thing. And actually in the House, quite deceptively, Joyce Grosser, the Prime Minister, all said, well, we'll make about $2.5 billion every year hmm. from these tariff reductions. You see, that was very misleading statements because what, we, what the authors of the um, analysis of this agreement have said is that actually two thirds of those gains, about $1.8 billion, are from non-tariff barriers. And apparently, according to them, will be 10 times faster in custom clearing. Uh, the banks, which are foreign owned anyway, will somehow become hugely more efficient in processing transactions and allowing the flow of money investment into New Zealand, which is almost unfettered and bordering on obscene as it is anyway right now. And, and well, there's all of those major banks. So all of those gains that were given a dollar value, that it won't happen. I'm except for, you the tariff, I've, I've, except for the tariff reductions. I put my political career on it, but even the tariff reductions, uh, uh, which will happen, there's, uh, I don't know, about a thousand pages of schedules saying what the percentage cut is, what year it will come in, what product it relates to, mm -hmm. and uh, what country we're talking about. Um, they, that will happen, yep. if, if it's signed. Um, but I think, put this into perspective, and I had a real fright when I spoke to an exporter friend of mine. Who was it? Someone from the seafood industry. And, no, forestry, forestry. And, and they were saying that in their discussions with trade and the um, MB, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, uh, in their discussions with officials, officials were saying, oh, well, our forests just aren't that competitive compared to the rest of the world. So we probably should just let foreigners buy them up and um, munch up immature trees and sell them off as uh, pulp to the rest of the country, never mind 
local production in value added and trying to make some money. And they said, well, our local guys just can't pay the world price, so clearly we're not efficient. They had a whole day conversation on what a subsidy was and how the US, Canada and Japan subsidise their agricultural industries, their forestry industries, by billions of dollars annually. Of course we can't compete. Of course our foresters, our local processors can't buy at the world price because all of these other forests around the world are either government owned or being incredibly hugely subsidised. We just can't compete. So that is the nature of the problem with the tariff reductions that we're supposedly going to get. As we went into the final rounds, uh, Japan came out and very publicly announced um, over a six month two rounds of subsidies for their farmers. And they said it was because of the TPP. They said their farmers would go out of business if they didn't subsidise them because they couldn't possibly compete with New Zealand farmers who are more efficient and much better at getting the end product to market. And that was with a 0.1% value add on tariff reductions in the dairy industry. So those, I can't find the numbers right in front of me, but they were, oh, total subsidies in agriculture is over $1 trillion, uh, will be over $1 trillion in US dollars over the next 10 years in the USA, Canada and Japan alone. That is what New Zealand exporters are competing with, not tariffs, not non-tariff barriers, but subsidies. We just, and it's not even a conversation in our trade agreements. The WTO is seeking to uh, decrease uh, direct agricultural subsidies to, um, to try and increase competition. The uh, farmers, instead what they're doing now is giving more subsidies to the industry and the industry is uh, distributing uh, to individuals. So the problem still continues uh, almost unabated. The other one, the other example that I like to use as a farce of these tariff barrier reductions is I'm in the same electorate as Todd McKay, who's the new trade minister. And he, uh, in an article to our local paper, highlighted how uh, forestry and the wood processing industry in uh, New Zealand, and because one of the big players in Rotorua just spent $60 million on their plant, he really wanted to sell the fact that forestry and wood processing will benefit. And in his article, he gave the numbers. So I <coughs> did a percentage change calculation to see how big this huge benefit would be to the industry. And it was 0.8%. That's the huge gain that the Minister of Trade has told the timber industry that they will get from the TPP at the end of all the reductions in tariffs. That's at 0.8%. It was the most ridiculous number I'd ever seen. And I was so gratified when I had the um, Wood Processing Industry Association president in my office a couple of weeks ago who quoted my own numbers back to me <laughs> and the notes to him. <laughs> He'd done the same math and was just as aggravated and frustrated as I was. So if industry didn't take the word of a national MP or a minister and just took it at face value and actually did some digging themselves, they might be a little bit more frightened about the proposition that is the TPP. I do want to say that those non-tariff barrier removals are farcical and they actually may compromise customs and biosecurity mm -hmm. in New Zealand. Uh, yeah. uh, that's a very real uh, problem with some of the obligations. And, and, I, and I put it to you that there, there will be some benefits. There will be some industries that will benefit 
from those tariff reductions. And I think seafood, kiwi fruit, and, and fruit in general will benefit. So the Hawks Bay, um, understandably, uh, is excited about the TPP. And so is the sheep and beef products. <clears throat> yeah, to a lesser extent. That their, their benefit is not as great as um, those guys. Mm-hmm. They are still dealing with tariffs and... Um, no, it's a Japanese, and, mar- Japanese market they're excited about. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so that's that part of this trade deal. They don't even pretend to call it a trade deal. So the problem is the other side of the coin. The trade elements are about five chapters in a 30 chapter document. And I've just taken it off my desk but it was literally this big, 6,000 pages. The China Free Trade Agreement, which I argue uh, New Zealand's economy would benefit, had benefit just as much from the China growth spurt uh, without the Free Trade Agreement, but often quoted how marvellous free trade is because of our trade with China, is 86 pages, including side letters. So that's another perspective, something very clearly tangible in the mind. That's the top free China Free Trade Agreement, 86, 84 pages. There's the TPP. Binders after binder, page after page. The, the biggest issue um, that I have with the TPP, and it's one of many as you can probably tell, was something called the Investor State Dispute Settlement Clause. And this is a clause in that investment chapter of the uh, document, which essentially empowers corporates to sue governments. Now, when I have con- when I had conversations with some big um, New Zealand corporates who were looking forward, who are probably still looking forward to the TPP, they got a bit of a frock. Because I said to them, um, for example, the uh, Chinese milk processing plant, that's uh, plants, plural, that are being built up and down the country. Um, we can have another night about the definition of investment and how they might benefit the economy, but let's say they are good for the economy and everyone's a winner. But the government, if it made a law on, I don't know, waste processing and um, uh, an environmental law and uh, milk plants had to do something to improve their process that would cost them money. I put it to Fonterra that Fonterra would have to like it and lump it because that's the law. And you have to do as you're told because we think the environment's important. And they said, yes, that's right, we do. We sometimes try and fight the law, but yeah, once the laws are in, we in the main do as we're told. Well, I said, your Chinese competitors probably won't. And they looked at me. And I said, well, under ISDS, and get this, if there's a perceived loss of profits, not an actual loss of profits, but a perceived loss of profits going into the future arising from legislative change, the company can sue. They can sue the New Zealand government. They can sue the New Zealand taxpayer and say, you're going to make it harder for me to do business. I'm not going to make as much money. I'm suing you. That is literally what ISDS empowers these foreign corporates to do in New Zealand. It is just mind-boggling. And I, I could use cases from around the world but maybe Greg can tell us at the end because he's um, very much into the detail. But um, the one I use at the moment is the um, XL pipeline, the, the Canadian oil pipeline that was going to go through the US, you know, US down through to California. So uh, as, to the best of my knowledge, there was no formal contract signed. But Obama came out and said, Look, actually, the threat to the environment's a lot bigger than we initially thought. It's probably not a good idea. We're not going to sign the contract. So they hadn't signed the contract. But this company 
had sued the US for 15 billion US dollars because of lost <coughs> profits. And there are examples around the world of mining companies doing the same, um, suing because environmental standards were placed on them. And they won, and, and to the best of my knowledge, some of them continue to spew out toxic waste into the environment. But they were compensated. Cow shit. Yep, that'll happen. When we finally get our head around just how bad all this, um, what you said is for our streams and um, the nitrogen levels in our soils, we'll do something about it, but the foreign owned investment companies will sue. And the Kiwi ones will have to like it and lump it. And I put it to those of you who can process that through, the New Zealand firms will have to pick up an extra cost. But the foreign ones won't. In fact, they'll be compensated for it. How is that an even playing field for New Zealand firms? How is that good for New Zealand business? How is that good for Export New Zealand? It's just nonsensical. Um, the, uh, we've just been uh, debating the uh, uh, copyright and patent <coughs> legislation in select committee, and the amount of uh, uh, submissions has been uh, good and in the main quite robust from industry. And just to put it mildly, no one can agree on whether this is good or bad. That's New Zealand industry telling us about copyright and patent law from the TPP. But what's funny, in the main, 80% of them have said, whether they support the changes or not, uh, don't implement the changes if we don't sign up to the TPP. Mm. Don't do it, leave it alone. It's just mind-boggling. And, and uh, the government may argue that uh, FAMAC will continue its operations as per normal. And there's some aspect of agreements, but they have to be more transparent by law on their decision-making process, have to write reports now and give them to the big pharmaceutical co companies. You can imagine the court cases arising from those, from the most litigious nation on earth, where most of these um, biologics are created now. It is going to cost us dearly. Right. In that case, I may be, there's no definitive proof, but you just look at the scenario and apply some common sense to it, and it's going to cost us dear. <laughs> so, in an attempt to minimise the worst parts of uh, the TPP, I, um, I actually wrote a very simple piece of legislation, I think it might have the a world record of being the shortest piece of legislation ever written in New Zealand. And all it said was our trade agreements shouldn't have ISDS in them. And, and in the main, that would have got rid of a lot of the really bad stuff. But it's still a really dumb, really bad trade agreement. What Australia has shown us now is how bad the China FTA was as well. They've just recently successfully renegotiated with China, and it's infinitely better than the New Zealand one. And we're supposed to have most favoured nation um, relationship with China to say any benefits that your other trading partners get, well, then we get them automatically. But it hasn't happened. And in fact, it's quite scary how when they sell us dodgy steel, and we even talk about having an investigation into it, they threaten yeah. our entire dairy industry. Oh. It's just unacceptable. And so Winston just got angry about that and came out publicly on just how we cannot accept those kind of relationships with our trading, so-called friends and trading partners. Oh, yeah. It was just huge retaliatory measures. And you saw what happened, National got scared. Nothing's been done. Yeah. And this is steel in our highways. How safe is that? <laughs> it just boggles the mind. They don't care. No, they don't. They, they don't, don't, don't seem to care. They don't care about the dollar. No. We're on a plate boundary as well. Well, that, that's right. 
That's right. It won't take much of a shake, and a shake we will have. Um, I have I have skimmed through um, a lot of the detail, uh, but I did want to say finish on um, some detail here about the um, TTIP agreement, which is the um, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership EU America. And so the German Vice Chancellor said, in after 14 rounds of talks, neither side has agreed on a single common chapter out of the 27 being deliberated. Actually, I won't go into too much detail, except to say, on that side of Europe, <clears throat> on that side of the world in Europe, critics say one of the main concerns with TTIP is that could it, it could allow multinational corporates to effectively sue governments for taking actions that damage <coughs> their business. This is exactly what we've just well, we, we've signed up to. We haven't technically ratified. That's a whole other conversation and a whole other piece of legislation I've written. But in Europe, the MPs, the governments, and the oppositions can see just how wrong ISDS is, and they won't even begin to pretend to think it's a good deal while that's still in it. Whereas over here. We've signed up, <coughs> and I could use so many derogatory terms mm. about uh, Grocer and uh, Minister Todd McClay, mm. but ladies and gentlemen, the, the benefits that we have been told that we will accrue from this trade agreement are so minuscule that on any given day, currency fluctuations could take them out or multiply them. So, for example, New Zealand First has a uh, piece of uh, private members bill to say, actually, we need to manage our um, currency bill. That would be much more useful to our exporters. So the margins are so tiny as to be nonsensical, and statistically, within the margin of error, that's how small we're talking when we talk about 2025, 2030. That's how tiny we're talking. And what we are signing ourselves up to, and government has the kind of ostrich head in the sand approach to it, approach to it, is it's, we've never been sued before, because we do have ISDS in some of our trade agreements already. We've never been sued before, so it's all right. We'll be fine. That's literally the argument they're given. Imagine if New Zealand first did that. The backlash from the media would be huge. Don't worry about it, it's fine, it's never happened before. It would be, just phenomenal. It would destroy a small party like us if we said, trust me, it hasn't happened before, so it probably won't happen again. Never mind the facts and the reality around the rest of the world. The reality is that what we have in the US, unfortunately, is a couple of scary candidates who at least have the decency to realise that their voters don't like the TPPA. So, middle America is just sick and tired mm. of these big trade agreements because they can see the icons of American business like Nike, for example. Nike might have, you know, a couple of hundred staff in the US who are basically the marketing team and the bosses, and even their finance. Um, their accounts, their production, are all sourced out of the US. There isn't a shoe made in the US. I, and I think actually their marketing team might be outsourced as well. So what's in it for everyday people? And I said to you during um, my contribution here tonight that there will be some who benefit from the TPP in New Zealand. And I think there will be. Um, I think the 1.5 or whatever it is percent, no, it was less than that, 0.8 percent gain in trade um, from the TPP um, is an exaggeration. But I think some industries will benefit. But I put it to you, and this is why I thought a bit of contact, context about neoliberalism is important. One of the biggest problems in the world today is inequality. And I say without a spirit of doubt, and in 
you know, the strongest voice I have, the TPPA will continue to grow and multiply inequality in New Zealand. Mm. There is absolutely no doubt about it. There will be a few who benefit, and it will be, you know, that label of the 1%. But independent research from around the world, from trade academics, have said that there will be job losses in New Zealand because of the TPP. Mm. They have, this is several research papers. Even the um, US um, Meat and Trade, the big agricultural ministry over there, um, they didn't write it explicitly in their report, but they pretty much intimated and hinted that actually in the US there'd be, there might be some job losses. Some of the reports said 600, no, 400,000 job losses in the US from the TPP. No wonder middle America hates it. Mm. And so you've got Trump talking about, um, you know, big corporates um, investing everywhere in the world except the US. And I think we'll see that uh, here in New Zealand. You've even got um, Hillary, who is the uh, poster child for neoliberalism and, uh, and the New World Order, dare I say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> so it must be real. <laughs> yeah, so it must be true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> just state facts. <laughs> We're already here. Yeah, even she <laughs> has done the analysis and realised her own support base won't vote for her if she says she'll sign the TPP. <laughs> and I put it in those words because she'll probably sign the TPP. What will happen though, and Obama just came out, well, I think it was today, and said he's going to try really hard to get the TPPA put through during the lame duck period. Yeah. It's really unlikely. The Speaker of the um, House uh, of the Senate there has said um, there's no time on the calendar. It's really unlikely, and that's probably the case. Like, so you're talking 95% probability that it won't be signed. Uh, what will happen though, ladies and gentlemen, is that Hillary will probably win mm. the presidential race and she will take the TPP and start again. Mm. Um, now, <laughs> do I put it so blatantly? You've got to hope I'm part of the New Zealand side of the equation <laughs> on negotiating the trade agreement from this side of the world because when she rewrites it and we're there, we take <coughs> the national sick offence signing up to anything and everything and claiming it's a win. We've got to put something in there that is good for New Zealanders. Because New Zealand First isn't opposed to trade. And in fact, there are um, very sad attempts around the world, and they're sad attempts because they're not good for big business, they'd be good for trade though. Um, around WTO, for example, the World Trade Organization is trying. But, uh, it will come back probably three or four years from now and uh, yeah i hope national's not in there alone mm -hmm. I, I, I genuinely hope that labor's not in there alone because uh, i've said they won't do anything about it either uh, if it's ratified and they get into government um so yeah we can't continue down this track mm -hmm. we must oppose things like the TPPA and encourage real trade. We can't expect the 1% to give the rest of us their leftovers and for us to be grateful for it. Um, we are seeing how Europe is combating the worst of their equivalent trade deal and why. And we're seeing, seeing you know, even nationals equivalent over in the EU saying the same thing, it's not working, it's not going to work, it's not going to help us. Um, I suppose in ending, I would like to see a government where, yep, businesses need to make money. <coughs> There's no doubt about it. Profit's a good thing. But profit taking or um, 
unfettered capitalism is actually not a good thing for most of us. And in a New Zealand going forward, uh, we need to put people first, the environment first. And then once you've had those conversations on how that's going to work, then we set up the playing field so businesses can go out and compete against one another and try and make lots of money and rah, rah, rah. But actually, unless people are being looked after, then what's it all for? Really? So on that very sentimental note, I finish my contribution tonight. And thank you um, for your attention. I have time for questions. Yes. Um, the natural capital, you talked about work and people capital, but the natural capital often doesn't figure in economics. And we are just seeing you know, water being polluted, drinking water in some of our towns, in the news, big time. And this race to the bottom for profits with no subsidies, uh, I, I fear our pristine, one book, what was once a pristine environment is going to be so polluted, everybody will be sitting some of the rains, water would be found, and, and we will lose all that natural capital of our once yeah. So, in short, uh, I agree with you, there needs to be more consideration of it, and it's not just me who agrees with you, I speak on behalf of New Zealand First as a political um, party. Um, our environment is critical, and um, let me be cold blooded about it in, in a kind of business argument case. If we don't have uh, the natural environment that we claim that we do currently, if we don't have that going out to the rest of the world, then we've really got nothing to sell them. You know, even if you just look at it like that. But let's be clear, we can't let over-intensification continue. Um, if this kind of race to mass production, low margins, high volume, is ludicrous. Um, I don't think it's for the government to make a law, but you can incentivise different behaviour or disincentivise. I'm also thinking of selling water and fracking. Fracking just totally destroys aquifers. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm not sure if we actually have a policy or not on fracking. Um, I think we do, and I think we're opposed to it. Um, and uh, even the New Zealand case, which has been going on for what 50 years. Uh, we're told by national, you know, it's not been an issue with that. Actually, when you look at the detail, actually there's been quite a bit of um, yeah, negative side that. effect with fracking, even here in New Zealand. Um, what was the other part of that? Um, contamination of water bearing Oh, no, selling water. And selling water. No, now, um, our policy on water is that if we have absolutely no doubt that we've got a lot of it in a particular aquifer, then yes, you can um, um, take it for commercial purposes, but only after the, the citizens of that town uh, can be absolutely assured that their water supply won't run out. And I hear stories around the country now where people are being asked to um, not water their gardens or shower for so long or have a bath so that commercial users can have it. Now that is absolutely wrong. But if we have, without a doubt, knowledge that that aquifer is so many billions of cubic metres. Yes, you can take the water out, but as, if you take it out of the country, you're going to pay us a huge, That's a huge tariff. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'll go... ...ratification process, and if there's any chance of us doing anything to stop it happening, that mm. now, it's So, I, I have a piece of legislation, a private members bill that I've written, um, an attempt to turn the ratification process into an actual ratification process. Um, because at the moment you are told that it must come before Parliament, uh, it must be ratified by Parliament, uh, we must enable the legislation, and once that's all done, it's ratified and we've entered into the agreement. Actually, the Executive of New Zealand have signed the trade agreement. And that's pretty much the end of the story. Most of the legislation, enabling legislation, could be done through regulation, not laws, and a few changes of um, procedure. They do need to change a few things. But really and truly, with the majority that National have as well, what is it, one or two votes, 
Um, you know, the Māori Party Act and United Future. Uh, even with the enabling legislation, they have the majority. They actually have it in select committee as well. There's a whole half an hour long conversation about how the select committee process was abused um, in the TPPA um, process here in New Zealand. It was a front to democracy, and I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating, it was an affront to democracy. And, and this ratification process is bordering on uh, farcical. So I've written legislation to, which essentially says actually Parliament must decide, which is what we're told will happen anyway, but it's not. So my legislation basically says Parliament must decide, and only with Parliament's consent can the Executive sign a trade agreement on the country's behalf. But it's already been signed. So, that's, that's so what use is it for us protesting on Saturday? Uh, well, don't underestimate the power of the people and protests. I mean, that's what's working in the United States. That's why both of the front-running candidates are too afraid. Hillary's too afraid to say she'll sign the TPP. Um, and we can still put that pressure on the government. Absolutely, around each of the name of legislation. So never underestimate it. In fact, I, I still say that the original document probably looked a bit different. And if it hadn't been for the hundreds of thousands of people who went out around those 12 nations and protested it, it would be a hell of a lot worse. Um, I know that's not much of a consolation, <laughs> but like it, 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 and it does add up in my mind. Those street marches in Auckland, and actually Wellington as well, were huge. And people saw images of that. They didn't really get much live video coverage on the news because those bloody corporates didn't want us to <laughs> see just how big it was. But the still images of the protests are amazing. And that, that has an effect. It might not be tangible in this moment, but I do believe it's in it, which is why I'll be out and about. Mm. So Fletcher, we, we, at the New Zealand people, um, we, there is a chance to, to stop it, to stop TPP? Yeah. Because the average person, like, like I was talking to people today, and they're going, oh, but it hasn't been signed, it's not going to happen. Mm. Yeah, what they're relying on is the fact that uh, Clinton and Trump won't sign it. Because it's but but so it's still it's still going is it going to go through or just what what what's uh, so from the perspective here in New Zealand right like now yeah um, the enabling legislation is going through uh, we just did the select committee process on the so problem. how can we stop it how, how can we we stop it <coughs> well what did I say <laughs> Are we recording? <laughs> <laughs> we need to do something about uh, some of these support parties. <laughs> the Greens seem to come out more strongly on the TV. They're weak. Where are they? Yeah, yeah. Well, hang on. <clears throat> They're pretty articulate in their opposition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, Labour. Kennedy is, um, I don't know, not the people's politician kind of thing. He's a very good man, is Kennedy. And a, and a great mind. <coughs> Russell Norman said heaps, but it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, and, and what's going to happen is um, Barry Coates will come along, and even with the video recording, I'll admit how much I respect um, a lot of what Barry has to say, and so he'll be a strong voice for the Greens on the TPP. Um, but, you know, really and truly, you've got Layla saying they'll. Uh, support it once it's in, mm. and only New Zealand First and the Greens saying that they won't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the messages you're implying is that we should abandon the commercial media and go to the free media, <laughs> which are the non-commercial media. I um, information. just came from the New Zealand They're First unbalanced. conference, and you can imagine our conversation on mainstream media. And it's essentially, that's what we said. We can't rely but on mainstream. It's gagged. It's gagged. They're all just puppets. 
Mm. Yeah, and, it, and it's not the reporters themselves. You meet these, and they're really young now, and they don't know what questions to ask because they don't know what they're looking in context anymore. Um, but they're paid poorly, they're overworked, and they've got editors and sub-editors who have got the word from the top, you know, be good on this, slander this. It's, and I'm not being conspiracy theorists, that is what happens, and some of them will tell us. I'll admit it to it. So yes, I, I, I call them the commercial media, of course, because they are far and own, they're owned by your mega 1%. Who are yeah. creaming it? They're not tricking down. They're creaming it that, up. That's, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Great. Oh. Oh. You go on, whatever. Right. Well, of all the um, discussion I've heard, no one has ever explained to me why it is that national is pushing for the Oh, I can explain that. Yeah, I, I often do get that question, <laughs> and so my my thinking is because I don't think I don't think the majority of them are corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think they genuinely believe that that one percent increase in GDP is a good thing, and, and that's the argument behind the TPP. Uh, our tariffs will come down, our GDP will go up. But they and, also have economists, so that that doesn't stand. For the well, person on the street without resources, but the politicians have a lot of resources. All politicians, not just national. Um, I'm not sure I get your point there. Well, but they've got resources to do their own piece of action. Is this true? Oh, well, I mean, I, you can do it. What, what I didn't tell you yes. um, was the official interest analysis yes. um, conducted for the government and for parliamentarians mm -hmm. was undertaken by the same unit that negotiated the TPP with the minister, <laughs> and they gave him the nod to sign it. And then those same people, and some of them are incredibly bright, were asked, do the interest analysis. Now, do you think, in any world, the person who said to the minister, <coughs> sign it, it's a good deal, will come back and provide numbers to show that it's not? No. That is the despicable nature of the um, situation that we're in. There was no independent analysis done uh, of the trade agreement. Right, but you have done um, an, an analysis of some areas. National politicians must be capable of doing the same. But they're, they're capable, but when your experts and your ministers tell you that this will decrease um, tariff barriers and will increase GDP, that's all you need to hear as far as they're concerned. And so they go out and repeat that mantra. And in fact, for an entire year, they were told not to talk about the TPP because they were telling some truths about it and it was not looking good at some stage there. But Bill English still has this old-fashioned thinking about GDP and it being the be-all and end-all yeah. of a measure of an economy and the state of the people in it. And it's only an indicative number that really doesn't mean that much. So an increase in 1% of GDP in Bill English and John Key's mind is a good thing and we should do it, bugger the consequences. I, I genuinely agree. It's the only reason I could think they would have. And the, the only reason for that would be because it's a bankster's world and the well, GDP... You're, you're implying some kind of And GDP, kind of GDP would be a reflection of the amount of debt that's being created in order to sustain all of that economic activity. Because like you have a car accident, that adds to the GDP, not you're fixing up your car or you're getting a new one and you're fixing up the body, plus all the activity of ambulances and the hospital and all the rest, it all costs money, so it all adds to the GDP. Mm -hmm. So uh, from that point of view, war is a really good thing. You know, mm -hmm. you waste a heap so of resources, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. so from that point of view, and given that John Key, is Bankster, and at the same time, Banksters were inserted in a number of other, uh, uh, as leaders in a number of other um, democracies around the world. You can see a larger, if you like, project underway, and we're just suffering the consequences the same as France and Italy and various others. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, I, you don't and, 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 and it, uh, they follow oh, the right ideology. On, okay. You don't necessarily have to subscribe to you know the banks taking over the world, which isn't the most ludicrous thing you'll ever hear today. Well, I have. But um, the the education of most of these young guys who are advising is this neoliberal concept. And so in their minds, this is how it works and this is the only way forward, and, and it's not. I didn't actually realise that it's all being um, taught as, as part of um, the finance. But um, just to carry on, um, I went to this trade um, strategy, uh, trade policy strategy refresh meeting yesterday um, in the Intercontinental Hotel where Todd McClay oh, yeah. and David Walker were presenting and that was filled, like it was a room similar size to this filled with business people and there was only two public interest representatives, that was myself and also Louise Delaney from the Public Health Association. Um, so I made a few, I intervened from the point of view of the terms of reference weren't broad enough, okay, which they're not. Uh, so, I mean, we need to get our heads around what's happening in that trade strategy or trade policy strategy refresh. And did they bring a report to the select committee about what they were doing in terms of the refresh? And I don't have to report to the select committee. Okay, so that's interesting. You could ask questions. Yeah, we, we can ask them to report to us. Yeah. But, uh, and you can ask them. them to broaden out this. Uh, I'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah, but they don't have to. They're, they're, yeah, I know, but I mean... We're a parliamentary group, group by the government. Yeah. Mm. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, sorry. Can I make just one comment about neoliberalism? Yes. When it hijacked the Labour Party in the mid-80s, yes. I saw then it was already a failure because well, I have a history teacher background. Right. And I knew about laissez-faire yes. and the anti-corn law movements and all those past neoliberalisms. Mm -hmm. And all it did was whittle away workers' rights, put children in coal mines, maintain slavery, mm. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And made it one percent mega rich. Yeah. And and it's always failed. And what was yeah. Well, so so let's let's. I think we need a change, you know, in eighty four or whatever it was, because it was way too much kind of government control. Um, so there's a debate on what that change should have looked like. What we know for sure now is we've gone way too far in one direction, and there is there is, in my mind, a medium where the government has a role, businesses have a role, and the outcome should be people. Is it going to implode from within? Yeah. Well, what I'm hoping is that the symptoms around the world are enough now that governments will act now so that we don't let it continue. Because if it does continue, it looks like it's an exponential movement and it will get so much worse very quickly. And, um, and it, it is frightening because most people do anticipate another global financial crisis and it is because we are just sticking to the thinking and um, unfortunately it may take that to um, get some real gusto behind the opposing movements. And the alternative economic thinking, which is plenty out there, yes. is a tiny yeah. respected people. What is happening? Where is it going? Well, I think one of the most important things is it's being heard. And so when I have a conversation like this in a room in Paraparee, people are nodding, they understand, they've heard about it, they've <coughs> disseminated the information, it's, it's out there. And so um, it's, it's what we do with it now. And, um, not a party political broadcast, but you know, people make a choice. Yeah. Um, I think the end result of this process, if it, it's allowed to continue, is catastrophic climate change, and and much of humanity will perish along all the kinds of life forms that we uh, enjoy. It'll be the end of humanity. 
you look back at the Stone Age for the few survivors. That's really. Can I'll I have lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very gloomy. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just gloomy. It's but I mean, see, um, in, in a lot of the work you. I've done, I've taken a lot of direction from the politicians of Europe. Mm. So you see a group there who understand, uh, hold on, yeah. you know, this isn't working mm. um, and we need to do something about it. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are groups that um, are going too far, um, you know, in terms of, uh, say, anti-immigration, which you might think New Zealand First is uh, a proponent of, but we're not anti-immigration, we're controlled, managed immigration and acknowledge yeah, yeah. skill shortages and a need for people. But, you know, you see some of this coming up, especially in Europe, of, um, you know, racism and, and things like that as a way to... I was reading an article today about um, uh, that you're either got the drawbridge up or the drawbridge down and it's your <coughs> the whole movement's around being insular or being the globalist. And it, it, it seems really like an extreme dichotomy to <coughs> um, But uh, it seems to be um, a fair statement around what's the solution going forward and unfortunately the debate is being insular or being globalist rather than well what's the combination of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Great. Um, just to answer the question about what to do about it. Do about what? Uh, TPP and the, the thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I, I think that's my specialty. <clears throat> um, what to do about things. Um, <clears throat> So we've been um, fairly consistently approaching our local democracies, our local councils, and getting them to get engaged because you get a whole lot of people involved and you get a council involved, you get all, all the politicians in the council, you get the, uh, the people behind the scenes, the planners and all the rest of it, plus the staff, okay? Um, and also you get a bit of media from that. Um, so we've been successful in doing that with a number of councils, larger councils, including the CACI Council. All right, so we've got another project coming up, which is the um, TPP free zones, right? Similar, okay? Now, local government's been smashed by the federal government in relationship to the Local Government Act. So the current Local Government um, Amendment Bill, number two, right, just been uh, processed through the Select Committee, and that's about the Local Government Commission, so that's an appointed body from the government, tells local councils that they have to put their assets into council controlled organisations or tells them that they need to move towards an amalgamation. All this arbitrary bullshit mm. from Central. Now, never have I seen so many local government bodies up in arms to the extent that they are currently. And, and a lot of... So at the... So these guys, New Zealand First had their um, conference down in Dunedin, but a month and a, or six weeks ago, local government New Zealand had their conference down there as well. 97% of local government um, members to their AGM, so that you've got to be appointed to it to vote, right? Supported a resolution telling the government to shove that legislation mm. right up their ass, right? In slightly polite of terms. <laughs> okay. Now, this is unprecedented. Right, excepting for when they removed the four well-beings from the Local Government Act back in 2012. Okay? Now, it just so happened that I put in a submission to this same amendment bill, and I was sitting in the select committee and presenting on Thursday, and I had half of New Zealand's mayors up behind me, right? <laughs> so, and so we can hit them and go back to them and, and get that issue before the councils again, and it's important that people turn out on the 10th of September, right? Go out on the 10th of September and show your opposition, right? Because that, the only way we can move something is by being public. Public, yeah. Right? Right. And what we're going to do is we're going to give Fletcher a hand and then would you like to come up here and just finish what you're saying because Fletcher has to shoot off. Oh, okay. I have a, I have a curfew.
<laughs> the house is under urgency and I have to be back by four nine. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, okay, she is. What horrible thing are they going to do under urgency? Uh, they're doing the.